All right. So what we're going to be talking about today is that Steve had this experience that it was, um, he's had the experience of a hot day and he wasn't very happy about it. And he was thinking that it shouldn't be hot. You know what I mean? And is that right? Well, I was hot, but I shouldn't. The thing was, I was in a quest for a part and it shouldn't be so difficult. Why is it so difficult? It shouldn't be like this. Okay. And, and that's causing conflict in my mind until I realized, wait a minute, why am I even saying that? It is the way it is. Yes. Um, yeah. And then it, I was still walking in the sun, but I didn't feel hot anymore. I just, it, well, it wasn't as oppressive as it was when my thinking was uh, thinking that it should be something different. It was yeah. just causing a lot of a lot of my own conflict and suffering. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what, what we're often confronted with, if you think about it, is we are our experience fragments into two parts, the resistor and the resisted. Okay, this is, and it's like this, isn't it? Right, it's like this. Now, Dianander gives us a very interesting principle. He says, the basis of reaction is the non-acceptance of fact. You know that? The basis of reaction is non-acceptance of a fact. Now, acceptance doesn't mean agreement. Okay, so when you accept the fact that someone is being rather unpleasant, right? It's not that you agree with their behavior or even agree with what they're saying. You're just accepting the fact that people are like what they're like. And the thing is that when when there's... So for, for Dayananda, when you're being accepting, you're accommodating. Now, if, if, you, if you heard of me talk about accommodation, Accommodation means you make room for things. You know, when you accommodate people, you know what I mean? You make room. So basically, you have to make room for what is. You accommodate it, right? So here you are. So when you're being, being accommodating, it means that you're facing what is. Because it's there, I'm seeing it. And you're not denying that it's there. And you're not resisting the fact like, oh, I can't stand that. Because that, oh, I can't stand that, is a reaction. And that reaction against reality is normally what you take to be your life and being. Okay? So what happens is something happens and I go, oh, my God, I can't stand that. I'm having an experience of myself as a sufferer of a present event. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm taking, and I'm going, like, oh, God, I'm upset. I'm taking myself to be the upset, aren't I? Right? So oh, instead, yeah. of, instead of just simply the fact in front of me, I'm now being something in relation to that fact. I'm being a reactive person. I'm literally being the reaction. Because the reaction... Out of the reaction comes a sense of my life and being. Who's ever noticed that? Who's ever got into an argument with someone? Who's ever done that? Yeah, I have. Yep. Now, when you, when you, I don't believe that, Stephen, not you. Um, <laughs> so when you're, when you're in an argument with someone, you're being an arguing person, aren't you? Someone who's upset and, 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 uh, it, so what's happened is, is in an argument, there is the resistor and the resisted. So if I'm having an argument with you, Stephen, where's the, where, what side is the resistor on? You are the resistor, and I, I'm the resistor. Get that, get that. I am the resistor. Yes. And, what, and who is the resisted? Uh, the other. Yeah, you. So now this fundamental fact with human beings is that we get into conflict, conflict, conflict or antagonism or hatred or, or, or whatever it is, is normal for human beings. Have you noticed that human beings fight? They attack each other. Who's ever heard people talk about people behind their back? Who's ever seen that happen? A lot. Right? Who have, who's heard of people being critical, just 
I'm not talking about being objective and looking at facts. I'm talking about that narky kind of, oh, God, I can't stand that kind of stuff going on. Who's ever, you know, like in America now, there's probably a lot of that going on right now. All right? You know? <laughs> so, yeah. so we're talking about that. Oh, God, I can't stand that. Whether, whether it's left or right, it doesn't matter. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the reaction, right, of me being a resistor, me fighting, me disapproving, me antagonistic, because as human beings, we, uh, we suffer from craving, right? Desire, binding desires. We want, we want to have certain experiences, and when we don't get those experiences, we become antagonistic. Have you noticed that? Right? We may not be aware of the binding desire, right? But we've got a desire, a picture in my mind of what I think the world should look like. And I want that picture to come to fruition. All I want is the physical universe to line up with my desires. Am I asking for something unreasonable here? Right? I do. I want certain things. I desperately want certain things. What happens when I don't get those things that I emotionally have a demand for? What happens to me? Upset. I become, yeah, usually upset. Yes. And, well, basically, I become hateful. Okay? I become hateful, right? Of course, I sanitize it because my hatred is righteous. Right? My <laughs> hatred is righteous. The but is the other side who take an opposing view to me politically, is their side righteous or evil? Evil. evil. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> okay, so, so what happens is, so what happens is, my life is one of constant mindless reaction and the reaction always involves a resistor and a resisted you never have without that that is the if you want to know the structure and the nature of subjectivity it is the nature of it the the structure of it is resistor and the resisted the nature of it is notional now what i mean by that is Let's say that, and I'm not going to mention any names, but you have you see a, a political event happens, right? And the political event happens, and you go, "My God, how, you know, my God, or whatever it is, right?" I have a reaction about that. Is that true? And my reaction could be elation, yes, yes, or it might be, "This is wrong." It doesn't matter. Both are reactions. Would you all agree with that? Okay, both are reactions. Both create a sense of me facing something over there that's different from me. Right? Both of them. So the li my life as an ego, as an ego, is reactivity. Right? Is reactivity. And, and the things that I react against is I, who's ever reacted against their own mental reactions? Like, oh, my God, I shouldn't feel that way or I wish I wasn't feeling this way or who's ever done that? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we react against our mental or psychological content. Is that true? Who's ever reacted against people? Interpersonally or what the media gives us who's ever been sitting watching tv or watching youtube we don't watch tv anymore watching youtube right and who's ever who's ever had a reaction about what they're listening to of in of moral indignation <laughs> right or of abhorrence you know what i mean or or elation because i'm the elation because i'm getting what i want but I'm getting, I'm seeing what I like. So I feel very good. I feel elated. Who, who's ever had that experience? It, it is human life. This reactivity 
to something other than myself is happening all of the time. And then we have reaction to circumstances, my health, my age, whatever. But it always has the same thing. It's, I really want something. I really, I think it, it's necessary for my security and happiness for this to be like this. And, and with that as the context for my life, that's how the Buddhists say, you know, we're full of craving, don't we? Don't they? They say life, one of the life, the four, three poisons are craving, hostility or wrath or, or delusion. They're the three poisons. Diane Under called it binding desires. What are the three again? Inordinate craving. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Okay. <laughs> Habitual hatred. I hate, I hate, I don't like, I can't stand it. I hang, 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 hang. And delusion. Well. Because you see okay. what happens what happens is with, with the with the when the context of our life is our binding desires, which it is, that's our default position. All we're going to have, when with, with that binding desire active in me, I'm being a wanter, right? What happens is what have I got left? I can feel elated when I'm getting what I want I'm, or I'm going to feel depressed when I'm not getting what I want. Both of those things, that feeling of inflation, yes! <laughs> right? I'm sure that with certain um, political events that have been happening recently in America, there was many people who were going, yay! But there were also many who were going, ah -ha! Right? Same problem, different haircut. But there is such a thing as, as principles. No, and no, we're not, we're not talking about of being objective. Right, okay. we're, talking about, we're, we're talking about being reactivity. We're not talking about that, uh, that, for example, that when women and children are being killed, we can't say that that's good. Do you know what I mean? We're not, so that can be an objective fact, but but I'm talking about getting lost in our reactions in relation to that, becoming a mindless, reactive being in relation to what's happening. Jasper. That's that's what we're looking at when we're looking at the spiritual life, aren't we? Right? So we're looking at the spiritual issue here. The spiritual issue goes beyond left and right. Okay? It goes beyond left and right because if you if you think um, because no matter what ideological position people take, they feel right and they feel virtuous and they feel the other side is black and horrible and nasty. That's always the case. But that that hatred is is hatred. But it feels conventionally not hatred because it's we feel it's justified. Have you ever ha had justified hatred? Have you ever thought, my God, and you just feel outraged? But feel the but the outrage and the antagonism and the ill will feel right because of your political position. Have, who's ever yep. done that? Oh yeah. Right? So all I'm saying here, and I'm not saying there's no right and wrong. I'm saying we're talking about the fact of the matter is we're an inordinate cravers. We crave. We inordinately want. Stephen, what, what, you wanted to have a park, right? Yeah, I wanted this park and I wanted it now and I wanted to be done. Yeah, and did the universe line up with that wanting? Not so much. So what is the universe? Bad, <laughs> right? But that is that is that comes out of your craving. That yep. that cognition of oh my god, this is a sick situation. That very cognition, that way of seeing, comes out of the craving. It's a function of the craving. It is not seeing. It is not awareness. So what happens is. Thoughts arise in me, emotions arise in me, and I go, oh, God, I can't stand these. 
see the antagonism? But, but the resistor and the resisted. This is the structure of subjectivity. When we live in, you know, when we talk about living in our world or living in Ishvara's world, when I'm being subjective, I'm living only in my world. And you know what Dayananda says? Your problem is you're full of yourself and you're not instead of being full of each part. Right? So I'm looking at a world that is not providing me with a car park. Right? Is that an objective view of the world? This is a world that refuses me a car park. Very subjective. It's fairly subjective, isn't it? You know what I mean? Or a person says, oh, I just, wish I, I just wish I wasn't so angry now, but I'm angry. What's the fact? What is the fact? I'm angry. What is the non-fact? I don't want to be angry and I shouldn't be. That's subjectivity. What's the fact? I can't find a car park, park at this moment. Oh my God, this shouldn't be this way. That's subjectivity. I, I want to be in certain conditions. So what happens is we, we're we totally caught in this craving. And then what, when, when this craving is not satisfied, we feel an antagonism and ill will. Have you noticed that? Yep. Right? But doesn't that, particularly in political matters, doesn't that ill will feel incredibly right? The ill will feels right and natural and maybe even noble. And it's the same with the elation. The elation is just the other side of the coin. Yes! Mm. Yes! About time! Right? The absolute glee. It's the same disease, even though there's two different ideological positions. Can you all see that? It's very easy to get caught up in this. Yeah, usually um, uh, an outcome, you have either deflation or elation, right? That's I mean, it. It's, it's, yeah, it's like it's... I mean, not always, but I would say that that happens a lot. Oh, I mean, being a being a, a desire, you know, a binding desire, a, a being who's bound to these, you know, the binding. They bind you. They literally bind you. They got you by the. They got you. They got you. <laughs> right. So, yeah. if if I have these cravings for because what I'm seeking is I'm seeking the good, the ultimate good, the summa bonum, the ultimate good in the world and when i see the world as either giving me the goodness or taking away the goodness that is a way of seeing the world would that be true yep and it means that you're going to be happy about the world i reckon it's about actually unhappy two-thirds and happy third maybe a little bit less but i'd, I'd say that that's the that's the setup of the game because are my desires or cravings sacred? Are they sacred? Sacred. Yeah, important. we may think they are. Of course, they we make we make them incredibly sacred. They're our okay. religion. But yeah, okay. our heart, our heart. Don't so We give our heart away. We give it to furniture. We give it to goods. We give it to people. Our heart is dominated by craving. Which automatically means if you crave, you will automatically can't help but not only be a craver, but you're also a hater. That goes with the territory. But you won't see the hatred because my particular hatred, Stephen, is sacred. Because it's virtuous. I'm hating evil. Right? I'm hating evil, Stephen. It's not that I'm full of hatred. No, the hatred I'm having, this antagonism and ill will, is virtuous because the other side is bad. 
So do you see how I don't see my hatred? Mm -hmm. Because I put it into a conventional, I, I put it into a conventional setting, don't I? Conventional ideas, which are all subjective, by the way. You know what I mean? I'm a good person, they're a bad person. All of these conventional thoughts about life. There are good guys, there are bad guys, whatever, right? So, and I look through, I look at life through conventional notions. Left or right, it doesn't matter. When I'm looking at life through conventional notions, am I seeing reality or am I actually projecting a position, an idea that I have in my own head? An idea. Of course I am. And so, but I don't, when I'm caught up in it, do I see that I'm suffering from delusion? Mm -mm. Doesn't feel that way, does it? It doesn't feel that way. So this is constant. So when the context of my life is my binding desire, right? Which is, you know, we've all of us have got, all of us have got these binding desires, and they are basically in our minds. We've got ideas about how life should be. Mm, there it is. Should be right in order for me to be happy. Now, what chance do you think I've got of making the laws of the universe subordinate to my desires? Pretty slim. Yeah. What's going to happen is things are going to happen that I like and things are going to happen that I don't like. Is that true? Dianander says there's four things. So here I am. I'm facing the world. I'm facing experiences that I like, experiences that are more than what I like, experiences that are less than what I like, and experiences opposite to what I like. That's happening all of the time. Is spiritual life going to change that fact? No. No. Right? Because the issue is not, the issue, the spiritual issue is not what's happening in front of me. The spiritual issue is what am I being like in relation to what's happening in front of mm -hmm. me? It's a good one. Okay, what am I being in relation to that? So when I become elated, is that a reaction? Yes. When I'm being, the, you know, that gleeful elation, you know, like, oh, yes. Right? So when I'm full of elation, I am being an idea of myself that I like. I'm now feeling happy. I'm now being the happiness. I'm not actually, it's not real happiness, right? What I'm being is I'm feeling an experience of ego inflation because things are going my way. Right? And when I feel deflation, what's happening? Things, things are, are not going my way. Exactly. Now, how many people have experienced... Things not going their way. Yeah. Now, the whole spiritual aim is for, for Swami Dayananda is that we have a practice called the yoga of objectivity, don't we? Which he defined as the yoga of objectivity, which I like. It makes sense for me. I, I like that emphasis. The yoga of objectivity. And he said, the basis of yoga is sameness, didn't he? Why did he say that? Why did he say, why did he say that the, the, the basis of karma yoga, you know, is that yoga is sameness. That's what he said. Is, now, why, why does he say, well, what do you mean sameness? Right? When I'm chopping and changing, when I'm suddenly becoming elated, now I'm depressed, now I'm elated, now I'm feeling bad, now I'm elated, now I'm fighting, now I'm elated. 
Do you see I'm cho chopping and changing all of the time in relation to these four categories of experience? What I like, more than what I like, less than what I like, opposite to what I like. Is that true? I'm chopping and changing. Now, basically, the world is causing me to be what I am. Now, is that freedom? When I'm the my when my state of being is being caused by what is happening, is that freedom? No. That Sorry. That's the opposite of freedom. Absolutely. You're bound. I'm yep. completely bound. But bound by I, situation. Right. Yes, but if I can remain the same in the face of the changing circumstances, which is, by the way, karma yoga, the yoga of objectivity, that means that in that very sameness, there is no ego satisfaction or ego inflation, and there is no ego deflation, is there? And you still have your likes and dislikes. So, yes. I mean, there, there's yes. no wrong problem with liking no. the outcome. No. But the, but the, but the, thing, the difference is, is that what Diananda said, the difference between a binding desire and a non-binding desire is I want a, a, I want a car to be able to travel. That's just I'd like to have a car. I want a car so I can impress my father-in-law. <laughs> They're two different things. Right. So, so now the whole purpose of Vedanta or Dayananda's teaching is about freedom. Is that true? Moksha. Right? Yep. But if, for example, an emotional state happens in me and I and I, I don't accept it and I'm fighting it, is that being free? It's not being free, is it? I'm being determined by my mental states. Is that true? My sense of life and being is being determined by something that's happening in front of me. Because everything happens in front of you, right? Your thoughts, feelings happen in front of you. Dianander says everything is the part of the universe, including your thoughts and feelings. So the universe is happening in front of me, and suddenly I'm becoming elated. Is that being free? Is that so-called being happy, free, getting what I want? Is that being free or is that being determined? Being determined. It's being yeah. determined. Being determined. But you're liking the outcome, right? Oh, I'm like, I am free at the moment because I'm feeling happy. At the moment. Because I'm getting what I want. Because I've got this crazy notion that happiness is getting what I want. Okay? So, coming back to the yoga of objectivity, can you see that if we do not, if we can't remain the same, so ha the question is, well, how do you remain the same? Well, the problem is, you know how Dayananda says that Vedanta is cognitive all over the way. There's no how. There's a what. There's an understanding of what. Now, he said a very interesting thing about graceful acceptance. He said graceful acceptance is, is born out of our understanding of Ishvara. Not, you don't do. When you understand that everything that you're looking at is the presence of God, Okay, that the presence of God is away from nothing that you're looking at. What happens is you come to an understanding where you are being accepting. That doesn't mean liking. It doesn't mean liking. It means a way of being in which there is no reactivity. There's no psychological being caught up. We're having psychological reactions but we're not being the psychological reactions. You see the difference? We the yoga of objectivity doesn't mean not having feelings. It means that here you are, you're alive to what's in front of you, the, uh, what he calls aliveness to facts. 
So you're alive to the facts. Stephen has said something I don't like, and I think he's a jerk. I'm alive to the fact that of what Stephen did. I'm alive to the thought that's coming up that Stephen's a jerk. But I'm actually accepting the fact that that's what occurs. Do I have any control over the thoughts that come about in me? No. But can I remain the same in the face of those thoughts? That's the challenge. That's the practice of, the, that is the yoga of objectivity. Right. So, and this is the preparation to understand Vedanta. It's all very well saying, oh, yes, I'm Satchitananda, therefore I'm free. Well, whoop did he do it up, right? And that, not going to work. No. But, but what's true there is this, that in Satchitananda or in being life, be, being life, light, and fullness is freedom. That's true. But what, what did he say? In order for us to appreciate the fact of being life, light, and fullness, so that life, light, and fullness, that is God, is our very life, he, he said there's this preparation practice, didn't he? Which is called what? Karma yoga. yoga. Because... It's not a matter of me telling myself that I'm Satchitananda. I have to. In Vedanta, the most important thing is, is the fact that Satchitananda, life, light, and fullness, that is God, is abidingly present. Then, then there's also the material universe is coming and going. Is that true? So there's what... What doesn't come and go versus what comes and goes. Was that true? Mm -hmm. Now, that's the fundamental discrimination in Vedanta, isn't it? What is changing and what is unchanging. So if I want to approach an understanding of what Satchitananda is, what life, 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 light, and fullness is in my life, I have to know what it means to be to be unchanging. Otherwise, it's only a theory in my mind. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? So what happens is someone comes along and says something that I don't like. Right? Now, do I deny the fact in the yoga of objectivity? Do I go if, if the if, if the fact is someone has said something I don't like, and the fact is I don't like it? What's the fact? You don't like it, right? But what if I've got this crazy spiritual notion? Oh, I shouldn't have dislikes. I should I should feel nice and wonderful. I should feel feel loving. The difference is there's a difference between having a feeling of hatred and being the hatred. Does that make sense? Mm. The feeling is just a phenomena. It's a thing that comes and it goes. But when I am being the feeling, I am enslaved. So when we're talking about the practice of karma yoga, we are practicing being free. How about that, eh? We're practicing being free. How wonderful is that? But when we've got no spiritual idealism, we're not interested in being a nice person or a spiritual person or a loving person. We're interested in remaining the same. Remember, the basis of reaction is non-acceptance of a fact. So the practice of yoga is remaining the same in the face of changing experience. When we practice karma yoga, we're literally learning to be free in the face of changing experiences. And particularly... 
when we can remain, you know, when we're having reactions, it's necessary for me to remain the same in the face of my reactions because they are just a fact. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, there's a two-edged two sword here for karma yoga, right? There's a two-edged two sword. Acceptance puts us into the universe as it is. Okay? With that, you, if you're not, you cannot be alive to facts, you're caught up without being accepting. By being accepting, it means that that enables you to, to live in the universe as it is. Does that make sense? When you were wanting the universe to provide you with a car park, Stephen, were you looking at the universe as it is? When you were up thinking it shouldn't be like that and you're upset about it? Well, I began that, but then I really got frustrated. And uh, no, I wasn't. I, I wanted what I wanted when I wanted it. Yes. And when you're in that, basically, you were not in the in Ishvara's world, were you? Ishvara's world, no. the yoga of objectivity, he, he defines it. Because it's there, you see it. He says subject, I... subjectivity is because I see it, it's there. So because you were seeing a lousy world that wouldn't provide you with a park, that was the world you were looking at. Yes, exactly. You, you thought you were looking at something objective, but no, it was in your mind projected as experience. You were just a snake looker, Stephen. That's right. Okay. I, I went out with all good intentions, and what? the world didn't provide what I wanted. It's a bitch <laughs> like that, isn't it? Yeah, no good. It is. Okay, so... <laughs> Are we, are we clear now that acceptance, the practice of karma yoga, there's two, see, there's two aspects of karma yoga because sameness requires two things, two things. The first thing is that it puts us in the world as it is. Can you all see that? Acceptance, when I'm being accepting, I'm in the world as it is. I see something on YouTube and I see that I'm angry. I look at something at YouTube, I see I'm elated. Same thing. Okay, same thing. This is, you see how spiritual life goes beyond ideology. Right? Ideo There's no goodness in ideology. This just an ideology is just ideology. Okay? Now, so, being it, be, the practice of sameness puts me in the world as it is. The practice of Dharma keeps me in harmony with the world as it is. Right? Because Dhyananda says, it's not just simply being aware. He says, if, 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 God, if God didn't want you to do anything, he would have just made you with a head. But he's got, he's got <laughs> arms and legs. You've got to do stuff. Right? Now, what happens is this, is that who's ever had a strong emotional impulse that, you, that that's prompting you to do something? You know, you feel that kind of overwhelming, I, I just, I want to say it, even though I know it's wrong, I'm, I want to I wanna attack. Who's ever had that? Right. That's means that you're combined with that psychological state, isn't it? You're combined with it. You're, you're caught in it, aren't you? Right? Now, when you don't go with it, when you exercise choice over action and you do the right and avoid the wrong, do you see how, first of all, you're creating a distance between you and that, and that psychological reaction? Is that true? You see, when you're just governed by the psychological reaction, you're just lost in it, and it's controlling you, isn't it? But when you exercise Dharma, you create a, a, di a difference. I want to talk harshly to Stephen. But I go, no, I won't do it. The very fact that I'm choosing not to do it, can you see how I'm creating a distance between myself and that reaction? Right, so that's a that that's the practice. That's one of the practices of karma yoga, then, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay, because that's 
remaining in harmony with the order. So, so what happens? So what happens is my life as a wanter. Basically, that wanting determines how I act. But Swami Dayananda says, no, 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 no. You're looking at reality. What you need to see is what is needful. And notice, if I'm looking at what is needed here in terms of my response, is that perception of what's needed coming from my desires? Or is it coming from the requirements of objective reality? Where's it coming from? Desires. Sorry? The desires. Yeah, it's coming from the desires. So when I'm caught oh. up, when I'm caught up in desires, right? I have a cognition about reality. Stephen's an idiot, right? Right? <laughs> but when I'm when I'm going, okay, what's happening here? And what do I what do I need to do in terms of doing the needful? Can you see how that's being objective? So he says here, Gandharvana, Chitralataha. And then finally he says, Siddhana, Kapilomuni. Hold on. Yeah. So I'm being objective, aren't I? Do you see how this is the practice of you know, objectivity? I have to see what's happening and what is needed. And then I respond to what's needed. When I do that, am I being determined by my binding desires or I, am I being determined by what is happening? By being, what's my happening? being objective. What's happening? Yeah. Come, Dhyananda's understanding of, of karma yoga and, and how it's the practice of objectivity is just unbelievably brilliant because this frees us from psychological slavery. Do you see that? See, as soon as I turn away, from my living the context of my binding desires, living in that context of my binding desires. I'm actually now living in an objective context, aren't I? Because I, well, because I suddenly see that what I'm looking at is either the presence of God in the form of a fact to be accepted or the presence of God in the form of a duty to be done. There's no karma yoga without Ishvara. So, so, so here I've got two things. Do you see how this liberates me from all of this friction and all of this stuff? The yoga of objectivity lifts me out of a life that is that is ego bound or bound with binding desires. Do you see that? And, and what's wonderful is that every moment is an opportunity to practice objectivity. If you don't, there is no freedom. You can feel you're free. Oh, I've got all these spiritual understandings. Yes, I'm Satchitananda. Yes, uh, I'm just consciousness. I'm not my mind, body, and thoughts, and all of that stuff. What's that going to do? What's the, how's that going to help me? It's not real. But when I'm remaining the same in the face of changing, when I'm remaining the same, right, then I'm practicing objectivity. I am practicing being free. When I'm shifting my attention to what's happening and what is needed and when I'm responding to that, I am being free. Because my actions and my way of being in the world are not being determined. And Dhyananda says, without karma yoga, there's no moksha. He, he, karma, karma yoga, moksha isn't karma yoga. But without karma yoga, moksha will not be possible. Can you see how that's true? And you see how that uh, that practice of karma yoga, Stephen, liberates you from all of this stuff that we're talking about. Because the whole yeah, I mean, I, yeah, 
Yeah. Right. Oh, it's true. I mean, th this is how I started, you know, the conversation. And I, I see now that um, it's probably, it's a lot of it attributed to you. you. You've been talking about karma yoga for five years now. And uh, it's one of those things that you can hear it over and over, but until it, it sinks in and you understand what it really is in this world and, and that it really does affect you and it really does affect um, uh, your understanding of the world and your place in this world. Well, then it, it's not really understanding, but that's kind of what I was saying this, today. I went to get this part and I was getting very, I was getting very conflicted. And so I've learned when you have conflict in your mind, it's time to look, what, what is this? And to step, step back and be objective. What's causing this? Yeah, and for yeah. me, it was very simple. I was not getting what I want and it should be a different way. Well, that tells me right, right now, right here now, oh, there's something wrong. I'm not, I'm not looking at the world. I'm, I'm, uh, the world is as I see it. It's not, I'm not seeing it as it is. Very good, that's Stephen. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The world is as I am seeing it. That's when you were being subjective. That's it. Yeah. I've never, in all my writings, I've never come across the definition of subjectivity and objectivity like Dayananda, his little phrase. Subjectivity is because I am seeing it, it is there. Yep. Objectivity is because it's there, I'm seeing it. It's just unbelievable. One opens the door to Ishvara's world. But living in Ishvara's world doesn't just require, except, I'll just be acceptable, I'll, I'll just be accepting. Uh, uh, uh. It also requires a response. And what Swami Dayananda says in the the book called uh, What is Sadness? I think it's called What is Sadness? Or uh, it was one of, the, uh, one of his booklets. The basis of responsiveness is acceptance. So acceptance isn't I agree with what person's saying or doing. So I accept the fact that they're saying and doing that. Mm. And then and then you do the needful. When you do the needful, you are liberating yourself from the compulsion to satisfy binding desire. You're, you're living in a different context. See, we've got two different contexts. The binding desires, the cravings, and the um, reality and what it needs in terms of responsiveness. So... If I remain, I remain the same in the sense that I remain accepting, and I remain the same in the sense that my that my my responsiveness will be determined by dharma. That remains the same, no matter what people do. I'm going to respond dharmically. Is this hard, by the way? Absolutely. But is it is it a worthwhile and transforming uh, practice? Absolutely. Absolutely, it is. Okay, just a minute. Hey, Rani. Hi. Hello. How are you? Hello. Good. Welcome, Good. welcome here. Thank you. I haven't I haven't met you before, have I? Um. Yes, I have been following for, for the earlier part, the uh, first beginning for the two years. Yep. Then I was, then the recorded versions, and yep. of course I was not, I was not there in between. And uh, but thank, thank God, I received an, I, it came in my email, and I was quite excited and enjoyed. Oh, good. Well, welcome here anyway. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Because because I very I really really need this with my family conditions, and uh, of course. This acceptance, yep, it's a challenge. But it's a real challenge for me. Okay, I come from. I have a family yep. with two girls who are one is blind and the other one is visually impaired. Yes, and uh -huh. with my and with my husband's medical conditions and ours. So mm -hmm. okay, this started and she studied in Australia and she did a psychology and masters and rehab and she went to UK to do her mental health and uh, clinical mm -hmm. psychology. Mm -hmm. so, but the challenges. That we I see every day, every day. See, it is at least with this teaching, is a paradigm shift of thinking. Absolutely. Uh, that it is like I it is I can come to think I came with a debit card. So this is what I have to face, but I do my best yep. and move on and and move on. 
but the challenges are there every day but at that moment at that moment where the challenges are there definitely i get disturbed yes at that, but yes. i'm able to at least uh, sort of think a little later and it's beyond my control certain things that's right that, that's what swami dayananda made very clear to us we we don't we, we we've only got choice over action we haven't got we don't we don't choose what happens what what just arises and and that helps a great deal do you know what i mean and he the thing is he 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 was a very a very brilliant man and a very brilliant teacher and um, yeah i have i have attended his courses in yes. rishikesh oh okay yeah oh. yep. so the so uh, the thing is that but of course as we get older and they get older i mean a little bit of the fear factor which is actually which is wrong you know, we when we think of the future, it is a hope. So, oh, no, being, which being, I'm uh, uh, there, but now just one thing: being fearful isn't wrong. Fe yeah. Being okay. fearful is just, for, for Swami Dayananda. Being fearful is just a fact. But what, okay. what, what happens is, so we come to Ishvara exactly mm. as we are, fearful, mm. and then okay. and we let Ishvara just basically embrace us and lift us out of the fear. So. We don't we don't deny fear because for Swami Dayananda the importance is to be alive to facts. Um, I I've talked about this in some other some other. Uh, give give me an email later on today and I'll send you a, a talk I gave on this. Do you know what I mean? But okay. But because we don't want to, there's no wrong feelings. There's wrong actions, but there's absolutely no wrong feelings. Feelings are just a fact. It's when we get lost in the feelings that's the problem, but he's but he has a teaching where we can resolve that fear into the presence of Ishvara. But I'll so I'll, the fear. So is it wrong to have a fear and a hope? No, there's not. There's, there's nothing wrong with having. Uh, there's nothing. There's no. There's there's nothing wrong with having a hope, and there's nothing wrong with having a fear. They are they are just simply they are just simply what is. Okay. But but, okay. I'll, but I'll, what I'll do is because I, I, I've got to continue on with what we're doing. But what I'll do yeah, is sure. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll I'll send if you can can you send me an email, right? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, sure. And, and I'll, I'll I'll send you the thing. Okay. Thank you very much. Nice talking. Um. So. So with with the practice of well with the practice of karma yoga we're practicing objectivity. Does that make sense? We're practicing living in Ishvara's world. But we but what realize that when we realize that the presence of God is away from no no experience we're having, we can kind of relax in the face of that fact. Does that make sense? And he says that this understanding of Ishvara brings about this graceful acceptance. You can't do acceptance. You can't say, I'm going to be accepted. Right? The acceptance he's talking about comes from the fact that we understand that God is not separate and apart from any part of our experience or any aspect of our experience. And that, that uh, this fact enables us to be accepting. And what's really important is we discover God right here, right now, as we are. That's where we find Ishvara. Right here, right now, as we are. So if I'm in a mess, I'm confused, and I'm angry, and I don't want to be angry, but I'm angry, what's the fact? I'm angry. Yep. Now, this, is, now this is where I find Ishvara. Precisely there. So when I come to God and like I'm just like this and I just simply wait, here I am. Okay. And I let the presence of Ishvara come in, things change. But that's because of my understanding of what Ishvara is. I that way I don't get into sp spiritual idealism. Who's ever had trouble with spiritual idealism where you whack yourself and say, I shouldn't be like that, I ought to be like this, I can't be like that? Who who's ever done that nonsense? Many years. Right. But when we're practicing the karma, of, when we're practicing the yoga of objectivity, that has no place. There's only two places remaining the same in terms of acceptance in the face of changing experiences, seeing what's happening and doing the needful. Finish. 
All right? That's what liberates us from all of this nonsense. Okay, so Stephen, what's the main thing that your main takeaway for today? Well, I really enjoyed this talk. Um, and the fact is, I've heard it many times. And I see the fact is, is that it doesn't really have effect unless you understand what, it, what, it, what Dianon is saying. No. So I really like the idea of just remaining the same. And I understand that, I guess it's the yoga of objectivity, right? Remaining yep. the same. No, I, I like and, his definition of the yoga of object. He defined it in a book called The Yoga of Objectivity. And I, I have a much, I, I love the way he's done that because that's really good for us Westerners. Yeah. So, like I've already said, that's a practice that I looked at now because um, only when I'm feeling conflicted do I look at it. And um, like I did today, so uh, remaining the same. And I understand, too, when you get overrelated, that's the other side of the coin. Yeah. Now, when I get overrelated, I don't have a problem with that. However, I will. Yeah. it will be suggested to me by my uh, uh, better half that yeah. you should look at yourself. Why are you getting so just giddy? Because she'll say, you know, you go too high and there's always a, uh, the, the pendulum will always go the other way. You're going to crack. You're going to crack. Yo -yo, Dianander says it's a yo-yo life. It's a yo-yo, right. So I, yo -yo. I, think, I think it's um, it would be to my um, advantage to look at those times where I'm, I'm getting what I really want and I get elated and step back. And um, it's a little more difficult, though, to remain the same because what you're looking at what you're seeing in the world, you're accepting it, and you're accepting it plus, right? I mean, you're yes. overly accepting but, it. But just want to say something. Yeah, go ahead. In yeah. resting in the presence of Ishvara, which is always here, it, that's mm -hmm. how you remain the same. Once you know what it means to rest in the re lap of Ishvara, sameness is there. You don't, it's not, it's an understanding of a what, it's not an understanding of a how. So when we understand what it means, to rest in the presence of Ishvara, which the presence of the given is the presence of the giver. Once we know that, that's the basis of sameness. Okay. All right. Okay. Good on you, Stephen. Um, you go. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And I, I, I really like what Ronnie said. Like it's really a paradigm shift once you understand this. Yes. Yeah. It, it's completely changes. It. It stops you getting, believing in all this nonsense, political nonsense. It stops. It. It. It means that. You can be separate from all of that. Mm, very good. <laughs> Catherine. Um, I think that, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to grasp like it, the reality is there, so I am seeing it or Does it does the re is it the reality that makes um, the reality the reality is being presented to me mm -hmm. rather than I am I am conceiving of this reality. Very I'm, good. Just, yep. They're two different things. Yes. Yes. One is awareness. The other is interpretation. So you're looking at one is you're looking at thoughts, the other is you're aware of what's in front of you. So it's, it, so that's why people can say oh, I'm awareness, I'm awareness, and all that stuff, right? Well, okay, it's true that when you're being aware, you'll find that you come into you're just simply you're the same. You're being awareness in the form of what's happening. That's true. There's no there's no distance between you and what's happening. Right, but normally yes. that's not the case. In reaction, that's not the case. Hmm. No, it's not. It's not. Okay. Very good, Catherine. Kevin. Um, I found it very useful when you said that the spiritual issue is it's got to separate from what's happening. It's it's what I'm being in relation to what's happening is yeah. the. Uh, that's the that's the spiritual issue. Yeah, that's the spiritual issue because, you know, as you said, see, hearing of um, about the bombing of innocent people mm -hmm. 
it's never going to be okay if no. you like. Um, and I don't like it. No. Um, dealing with that in a in a hateful, self righteous way, yeah, isn't help changing that that no. happening that I don't like. Mm. It's not assisting with that. It's just me getting involved in my yeah. my my psychology. Mm. But I mean, there's a, but there's a place also for like Martin Luther King denounced racism. So the denouncing is not the same. That's doing something that's required. Whereas yeah. whereas when I'm become, when I'm lost in the reaction, do you see do you see the difference? That's the big difference. Yeah, there's no. I'm not. It's, I'm not bringing anything benefit. It doesn't mean that I can't do something that is constructive no. in terms of um, writing to my, you know, political yeah. leaders or whatever, and so they know that, you know, it's not, you know, it's not acceptable. But but we but, do know one thing. We do know is this: is that the real basis of say what's happening in Gaza is an inordinate craving, incredible hatred and delusion. And mm. the way we, it's very important to solve the world's problem as it, which is obviously there, as it exists in us, because we're related to it. Do you see mm. what I mean? We, we, we are responsible in that sense. Do you know what I mean? Because we become hateful, we become wrathful, we become full of delusion. That's the problem of the world. So if we solve that in us, that's probably one of the greatest helpful things we can do. Then we don't get into virtue signaling and all of that stuff. Mm. Very good, Kevin. Robert. Can you speak up, Robert? I can hardly hear you. I'm an old man, I'm an old man now. Mm. Um, is it better? Yep, better. Okay. No, there was a lot of good points in there of, you know, proper conceptual understanding. I can hardly hear you, Robert. It's not very good. Computer. That's <laughs> um, it. You touch one of these. That's no, better. That just helps you. You there. That's better, Robert. Okay. Try again. That's good. Yep. No, I, um, so it was just useful to hear you sort of uh, again and again and again, again hammer away at a proper understanding. I can hear, hardly hear you, Robert. All right. That's uh, better. In that case, what's that? That's better. It makes it better. It's funny you say that's better. What's, what, um... So what? 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 So just to get, so what you're saying is you said it found it beneficial that I kept on hammering away at this basic thing about karma, what karma yoga is, and what it, what it's not. That's right. Yeah. That's that's yes. the, that's the principle. If you know what, you know how. But if you don't know what, you don't know how. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. It's, okay, yeah. That, that was one of the things you said, which I didn't quite understand, but... Yeah, just okay. Just one time, it's not a question of how... I mean, it's not a question... Yeah, we, can, we can't hear you, Robert. We, can, we just... We, we can't... That's a bit better, yeah. Sp speak into the mic. Where's the mic? <laughs> yeah, no, better. Speak there where you are there. So if yeah, if you can just quickly elaborate, elaborate <laughs> on how the what is more important than the how. Yeah. I Dhyananda always unfolded what's what what is God? What is karma yoga? What is binding desire? Or he says it's cognitive all the way. So you just see the what. That's what he did. That's what he did for us when we were there. Mm. Okay. okay. Good. Amy. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> um, it was useful to hear again about our reactions to these things. You know, we, we feel something, whatever it happens to be, and yet we don't act from that. We act from what we know to be true. Yeah. Um, things are, are happening very quickly in the world now. Yeah. And uh, it it's it's easy to get caught up in that, but but harmlessness it has to um has to lead us, you know, the way we react to people, the way we behave towards others um, it can be very helpful and can help to slow things down. Have you noticed that when your heart is full of kindness, do you notice that you don't feel self-righteous, you don't feel hateful or any of that sort of stuff? And I so, do. You're at peace. Um, yeah. And, so when we're yeah. resting in the lap of Ishvara, we notice that we are being kind. And yes. to the degree we fall away from that kindness, for whatever reason, we are lost. We're not in God when we're being unkind. No. All right. Very, very good. Rani, would you like to say something? It, it, it is teaching me from what I hear. It's helping me a lot. All right, very good. All right, so make sure that you just send me a, that email and I'll send you, I'll send you the, the link that's got all the playlists, all right? Okay, thank you very much. I, I I don't teach Vedanta. I just talk about Swami Dayananda's psychology. Okay. I All need right. that. I think I need the psychology part very much now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, all, we, we all need it. He was, a very, he was a very beautiful man. He was also very kind. Not only was he wise, but he was kind and imbued with yes, a tremendous yes. sense of goodwill. Yes, very true. Actually, and I would like to add to this. Actually, even the COVID, the two years of COVID, also taught I think many of us to see life differently. Yes. To accept things, and what changes, and what was up. We were running very fast. Yes. But COVID period shows us a lot how unexpectedly people were going off, many pain and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. We've got. It, it become clear that we don't control external events. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very good, Rani. All right. So uh, a suggestion is that uh, remember what Swami Dayananda says, the problem is centered on us, what we're being. So we can be reactive in relation to what's happening or we can be aware. We can't be aware without acceptance. You'll notice, that, and you can't do you can't do awareness. But when you're being accepting, you will be aware. Mm. All right. Don't try to do awareness. Okay. All right. So if if you notice <laughs> if you notice that you're being unaware, then that's awareness. <laughs> okay. Good. So you just so Good. It's, it's acceptance. Good. It's acceptance that makes us aware. Anyway, lovely to talk to you guys again. I always enjoy this. And we'll thank see, you. And we'll see thank you. you. We'll see you next month. And yes. send me that email, Rani, and I'll send you the link. Yes, sure. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you. God love Bye, you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Love you. See you. Bye.